добрый день. Hello. Уважаемые коллеги. Hello, dear colleagues. Dear guests of our forum, we begin our discussion on the factor of victory in the Great Patriotic War. The Great Patriotic War is a major milestone in the history of our country. And World War II was a major milestone for the entire world in the 20th century. I believe that until recently, most research Until recently, major developments at war were interpreted from a military perspective. Today, we would rather focus on the economic factors. And before everything else, I would like to introduce our speakers, who are three famous historians. Stephen Kotkin, U.S. professor at Princeton, is the author of an outstanding work, The History of Stalin. The first two volumes have been published, and they are being translated into Russian, volume three which deals with the Great Patriotic War, will hopefully be finished soon. A Adam Tooth, professor at Columbia University, an historian who was probably amongst the first who began seriously researching the economy of Germany before and during the war, and his uh, book, Making and Breaking of the Nazi Economy, was translated into Russian and published in this country. Uh, Alexei Isaev is a famous military historian, is a director of the recently established Center for Military History, and he's an author of numerous books on military history, and he's also part of our discussion. Uh, we, uh, so, let us begin by saying that the war began for the Soviet Union with the attack of the Nazi Germany. And uh, it is an open question whether both parties were really prepared for the war economically. Let's begin with Stephen, your opinion, sir. For long term struggles. Thank you, Andre, uh, for the question. Thank you so much for the honor of being able to participate in the Gaidar Forum. Uh, let me begin by uh, underscoring that the Soviet Union was victorious. The victory was not caused by Hitler's mistakes. Uh, Stalin made as many mistakes, perhaps more mistakes than Hitler. It was not caused by the weather. The Soviet Union won on the battlefield, and it won on the home front. In explaining that victory, as Andre said, we're going to focus more on the home front today. I would answer your question, Andre, uh, by stating, uh, first of all, that no country was ready for such a war. It was impossible to be ready for such a war in peacetime. That includes Japan and Germany, the two initiators of the war. It also includes the Great Britain and the United States. The United States was perhaps the least ready for the war, uh, but of course it ended up being very soon the most impressive economy in the war. So no, 
The Soviet Union was not ready for the war, but it could not have been ready for such a war economically. If we take some of the usual aspects, for example, the pre-war location of industry behind the Urals, which is sometimes given as an explanation of the Soviet Union being ready for war. Uh, this does not hold based on the evidence. The pre-war industrial base behind the Urals was very small, minuscule compared to the industry in the traditional regions of Leningrad, Moscow, the Ukraine, and of course the Volga Valley. It was only the first five-year plan where there was significant investment in industry behind the Urals, and in the second and third five-year plans, much greater investment in traditional areas of industry. If we take one other aspect, then I'll conclude my answer to your question on the second aspect, the scale of Stalin's forced industrialization. We hear a lot that because of Stalin and the way he conducted forced the country to industrialize as quickly as possible, that this made the country more ready for war. The problem with this argument is that the Soviet Union fought the war with only two thirds of the industrial base that was created by Stalin as of 1940. It lost one third of the pre-war industry industrial base and fought the war without it. And so the idea that, that Stalin created of necessity, the kind of industrial base that would be ready for war is only partly true, and we can debate that issue further. Okay, uh, Adam, what's your opinion? Was Germany economically prepared to the war? Uh, thank you, Andre, and I, I like Stephen, I'm extremely pleased to be taking part in the Gaidar Forum. I regret very much that for a variety of reasons, it's clearly impossible to be in Moscow in person the last time I was there. It was a wonderful event. I mean, your question, um, obviously from the German side, has a slightly different meaning um, because Germany was already at war um, in the summer of 1941. Um, it had been, of course, since the fall of 1939. And furthermore, its attack on the Soviet Union is a premeditated act of aggression um, with considerable preparation on the German side for this assault. This is not a war like 1914, where the armies, as it were, launch from a standing demobilized state. Germany has been planning in detail, um, down to operational detail, the assault on the Soviet Union, at least since December 1940. But nevertheless, the answer to your question is the same, I would give, as Stephen gave. In other words, Germany is not prepared for a long and protracted war on the Eastern Front. And that points to the staggering, vertiginous, dizzying irresponsibility of German military planning for the invasion of the Soviet Union. It is a gamble that the Soviet Union, the Red Army, can be decisively defeated um, within really one bound, the first 500 kilometer bound of the Wehrmacht's assault are on the Soviet Union, freeing German forces and economic resources to be redeployed because Germany continues to be and anticipates being in an even bigger war, which is against the global powers of the British Empire and ultimately the United States. And if there is one single element that can make sense of this on the face of it, fundamentally well, it's extraordinary to call it irrational maybe misses the point. It's an incredible gamble on the possibility of knocking the Red Army out so as to then pivot. It is the organizing racialized ideology of the Third Reich, which has a variety of different phenomena, but one of them is that, as it were, it claims that a, go a total war is inevitable. It's not a choice for Germany. It's already happening, and against the Western powers as against the East, and furthermore, in a minor key, on a smaller scale, the more banal assumption that Russians, that Slavs are subhuman and therefore can be overwhelmed in that first assault. So racism enters into the details of German operational planning so as to square this equation, which 
by December in front of Moscow, if not already in August in front of Krakow, has come apart at the seams. Okay, uh, Alexei, any comment concerning this uh, point? Uh, in Russian or in English? Up to you, but maybe uh, in English uh, to speak about uh, this. With your permission, I will speak Russian. It will be easier for me to, to formulate and work things properly. Um, in my lecture, 15 minute lecture, I assumed that the Soviet Union was getting ready for a past war. And the country and uh, the economy was getting ready for an infantry type war, a war of the previous kind, World War II. And it was relying on the capacity that was most relevant for the First World War and a different kind of warfare based on gunpowder production, the pyroxyl and gunpowder, whereas uh, the rest of the world were using nitroglycerin and the low propelled artillery, which was not up to the mark in the industrial era. So especially in the mobile warfare, the tank-driven warfare. Yes, the Soviet Union was getting ready, and still there were so many mistakes, serious mistakes, errors, and omissions made in getting ready for capacity building, like the construction of low-speed tractors and gunpowder factory, factories that were churning out pyroxyl and gunpowder. Or this is what Soviet authorities counted on. I would venture a joke. Germans believed that everybody who were dressed decently near Moscow were coming from Siberia. That was not true. They came from Kazakhstan, from Siberia. There is also a delusion that there is an industrial center sitting somewhere deep in the Urals. I believe the significance of the Urals and its Urals industrial base was exaggerated. I do not agree. I would beg to disagree with Stephen that industrialization uh, was like, to some extent, a squander of resources and investment. It created a groundwork, a basis, Stalingrad Tractor Works, that was probably the only manufacturing um, facility for T-34 tanks. Yes, the old one was located in Kharkov, in the old traditional industrial era. However, part of the equipment was transported to the Urals with uh, the reserve capacity of a non-defense factory that was busy churning out uh, railroads and rail engines. Also, during industrialization, we, uh, the Soviet Union commissioned a lot of aluminum producing factories, and this aluminum enabled the Soviet Union to produce wooden aircraft with aluminum parts near Leningrad, yes. However, the aluminum was actually was made was smelted in the Urals. Everything was very contradictory. So there's a lot of pro and contras. On the one hand, Oh, the Soviet Union was ready for a war industry-wise, just because they produced so many motor vehicles, and the motor vehicles were our salvation back in 1941 and 42. So there are so many contradictions here, so my answer would be both yes and no. Thank you. We now have two different options. We have to agree with the idea that nobody was ready properly, and Alexei says that Soviet Union, to a certain extent, was prepared to the war. Uh, okay, the war started. Uh, first uh, months were disastrous, uh, a lot of losses. Uh, it was necessary to retreat. Uh, 
uh, evacuation started. Uh, traditionally, evacuation is considered to be a great success and very well organized, but recent research shows that it was not as it was not exactly so. Uh, also, it is not absolutely clear what do we call successful evacuation of, say, particular plant. If 30% of staff and 40% of machinery is evacuated, is it okay? Is it successful? Or is 60% of staff and 60% of machinery is evacuated? Is it successful? But if this machinery reaches the destination and is not able to produce the production in the necessary quality and the necessary quantity, is this successful? So the question is, uh, was evacuation successful from the point of view of our experts? Okay, let's start from Stephen. Uh, given that 0% evacuation is a failure, 1% uh, evacuation is success. 2% is better, 3% is better than that, 20% is better than that. Whatever you're able to evacuate is a success. But here is your problem. Why are you undertaking evacuation at all? The only reason you are evacuating industry is because you don't understand modern war and you miscalculated uh, German intentions and German mobilization capacity. So evacuation is ipso facto a failure because it's necessary in the first place. But it is a success if you get any of your industry out. They were able, as Alexei pointed out, to evacuate some of the tank production equipment and the tank production technology, but also the workers and the specialists. This is very important. If you break evacuation down by high priority sectors, then of course the movement of tank production is much more important than any other evacuation. Munitions, tanks, aviation. If you're successful to a certain extent in those areas, that's an achievement, but an achievement within the failure necessitating evacuation in the first place. Let's take a step back, Andre, and think about where this industry came from that was evacuated. All of the technology of the first and second five-year plan, all of it, except for synthetic rubber, so-called caoutchouc, every single first and second five-year plan, industrial either expansion or creation of a factory was imported technology from other countries. Mostly it's machine tools, what in Russian are known as stanky. This machine tool import is decisive in Soviet industrialization. Without this imported high quality technology from Italy, from Germany, from France, from the United States, including from Nazi Germany, let's remember, because Hitler was shipping machine tools to Stalin up to the last minute in exchange for the raw materials. This import of technology is what is evacuated under duress when they've miscalculated what type of war they're going to be involved in. And so Alexei is right. There are industrial uh, factories producing very important priority defense industry materials. The question, however, is you can build a tank factory in many different ways. You can build it by wasting investment. You can build it by wasting output because a lot of it is what is called brak in Russian or waste. You can build it with massive loss of life. That's how Stalin built it. He built it with wasted investment with wasted output, with massive loss of life, but yes, he built it. And so it's not enough to argue that they had the technology and they were able to produce the tanks because you can produce tanks in many different ways. The United States also produced tanks. 
but the United States didn't produce tanks with, with massive wasted investment, massive loss of life, and massive uh, wasted output. Now, the Soviet Union won because it produced those tanks. That's a bottom line, unarguable proposition. So for us, the issue is, were there other ways to do this besides the, the way that they did do it, which helps explain the victory? Uh, Adam, uh, any comments? And also, whether the Germany had uh, any problem of evacuation, or that was too short when the Soviet uh, uh, offensive started and the Allies started Second Front. Was there a question of evacuation at all in Germany? Uh, there was indeed. In the later stages of the war, it becomes an overriding preoccupation, not because of the invasion of land armies. By that point, the war is clearly lost. But in the phase from 42 onwards, um, it's crucial because of the intensity of strategic bombing. And if you are thinking about um, the dilemma, the grand strategic dilemma that Germany faces and why I am as definitive as I am in saying that I find Germany's defeat more or less foreordained, it's when you compare its limited economic base in limited industrial base with the three-dimensional war that it's trying to fight on land, obviously preeminently against the Red Army and the Soviet Union at huge cost to the Germans as well. Um, on the sea, the war that they abandoned first, essentially the surface navy already in Norway in 1940, the undersea war, the U-boat war by 1943, the wolf packs have been pulled out of the Atlantic. But the war that is most expensive, more expensive than the land war, more expensive than the tank war, is the air war. Initially, of course, the Luftwaffe is heavily deployed to the Eastern Front in 1941. But as the Allies' strategic bombing offensive begins, um, it has to be redeployed. And the other move the Germans make is, in fact, an evacuation of sorts underground and into areas which are more remote, notably Poland. Auschwitz, the great chemical plant and death camp, is where it is because it's far away from bombing. It, it was, uh, that's, in a sense, a kind of evacuation. And it was only reachable by Allied bombers once we had air bases in Italy to attack it from. So yes, there's an evacuation. And the conclusion, though I don't think I agree with Stephen's overall evaluation of the Stalinist industrialization drive, the, the basic point that evacuation is hugely inefficient and causes a huge loss of efficiency holds for Germany absolutely as well. By 44, 45, they are able to produce aircraft underground. They produce the V2 rocket, famously in mine shafts in a mountain with concentration camp labor. It's a nightmarish scene, but it's grossly inefficient. Um, when you redeploy a big, complex, modern factory, you inevitably suffer losses of efficiency. Whether, in fact, in the end, it's true that Soviet, say, tank production, T-34 compared to a Sherman, for instance, in terms of overall resource input, including capital wastage, is more wasteful in the Soviet Union. I, I seriously doubt, to be honest, the price data that we have about those two vehicles, setting aside the much greater merits of the T-34 as a combat vehicle, don't suggest that at all. Um, it looks to us as though the cap of the war effort of the United States was a giant bonanza for profiteering on the part of Detroit. And so that is not a recipe for efficiency either. But the comparative work that would be necessary to do that has not been done despite the heroic labors of people like Mark Harrison in the Soviet archives. We haven't got the comparisons. And so everyone is left with their national romance of industrialization. The Americans have Freedom Forge and the arsenal of democracy, and the Soviets have the heroes of labor riding out from the factories to do battle with the Wehrmacht. We don't have the statistical basis, in, as far as I'm aware, to actually do a proper point-to-point -point comparison. It would be doable, it would be a great project, for one of the institutes in Moscow to take on. Let's compare what it costs to make a T-34 with what it costs to make a Sherman with an 85 millimeter gun, a proper one. Okay, thank you. Uh, Alexei, uh, any comment from your side? Um, um, <clears throat> about uh, evacuation, one uh, thesis, uh, I think, uh, important. To my mind, uh, Soviet evacuation is, in fact, a combination of equipment movement uh, from the West and 
uh, the mobilization of previously existing plans. For example, Chelyabinsk, uh, famous uh, Tankograd, uh, is a melting pot of evacuated equipment from different places, not only from uh, Leningrad, and Stanky uh, of Chelyabinsk tractor factory. And uh, this uh, factory, um, within uh, 13 years, produced agricultural uh, tractors. And uh, the same thing is uh, Stalingrad uh, tractor factory. Uh, and uh, this uh, factory also produced tanks. Uh, more complicated uh, case is uh, uh, military uh, factories. For example, uh, Perm uh, gunpowder uh, factory. Uh, this was a huge uh, factory uh, not completed uh, until uh, the beginning of war. But uh, this uh, incompleted uh, factory received equipment from already existing uh, factory from Donbass. Uh, uh, I mean uh, factory number uh, 59 from Petrovinki. And uh, this equipment could help uh, complete the building of uh, large and modern uh, plant uh, for gunpowder. The modern cardite um, powder. And uh, that's why the um, Soviet evacuation uh, isn't uh, so successful as uh, our Soviet literature explains, but uh, Soviet evacuation based on um, mobilization of uh, many plants. And these many plants uh, was well built uh, during the industrialization. And uh, that's why uh, we can um, make some calculation and uh, define the real role of um, industrialization. It's a costly, it was costly. Uh, it uh, was very complicated process, but uh, in fact, uh, industrialization was the base of the victory because um, without this uh, base, uh, any movement of equipment uh, will be unsuccessful because uh, it's impossible to uh, create a new factory in the forest, for example. But if you uh, 10 years built in this forest uh, perm gunpowder factory, it's, uh, it will be successful. It uh, produces uh, gunpowder for uh, rocket launchers for, uh, I mean, Katyusha, so-called Katyusha, or Stalin organ, uh, as uh, it, uh, called by Germans. And uh, to my mind, uh, the Soviet evacuation was a partially uh, successful. It's not successful, uh, as successful as uh, described above, uh, before, in, in Soviet literature, but in, in fact, uh, successful uh, process and uh, with uh, some um, mistakes and uh, some drawbacks of it, uh, of course, it was a successful moment. And uh, German also faced the same process when uh, some factories and plants uh, should move from the west to east to um, occupy uh, Poland and uh, so on. Okay, uh, colleagues, we have now spent two thirds of our time and uh, I think that our discussion cannot be as comprehensive as we would like, but uh, I also hope that it is not our last meeting and um, we have recently created this center for economic uh, of the war, um, military economic, and Alexei is the head of this newly organized uh, um, structure, and therefore I hope that we could continue these discussions in different ways, maybe with uh, other 
colleagues who has been mentioned, like Mike Harrison and so on. So maybe we can now move, uh, skip some preliminary plans, but uh, make a, a sort of a general comment of the sources of uh, victory of the Soviet Union and the reasons of the defeat of Germany. And maybe we will now shift back to Steven. And uh, you have three, four minutes for uh, sort of general comments. Uh, Alexei was correct about the nature of the evacuation uh, precisely described by him. Uh, priority areas and also not just the technology, but also the workers and the engineers and the managers. So I want to talk about the cadre for a second. Adam is also correct that there was a lot of waste in the U.S. defense industry. At the same time, the production of airplanes was phenomenal. And so the industrial potential is far greater overall. As far as the T-34, it got better over time, but of course the gearbox didn't work uh, the first year and a half. So let's, how did they win? And I would point to three ways. First, the system. The system was able, as Alexei pointed out, to mobilize colossal resources on behalf of the war. It didn't mobilize those resources always efficiently, as he also pointed out, but it was able to mobilize resources for the war. So it produced and it mobilized resources as a system. So we must give the Soviet system part of the credit for achieving the victory. Here there are also mythologies, but I'll skip them. Secondly, there are a lot of cadre who deserve also our attention. There is an entirely new cadre of industrial managers and engineers, and also of highly skilled workers. And many of them are evacuated with their factories. And sometimes the workers are evacuated more efficiently than the machines. And sometimes the machines are evacuated more efficiently than the workers. But nonetheless, there is a built-in personnel achievement, personnel achievement of many, many tens of thousands of people who have experience managing factories and also working in the shops. So that's very, very important. On the military battlefield side, Stalin did less well than he did on the military industrial complex cadre side. That's a complicated question, but it took him much longer to find field military commanders than it did for him to find military industrial complex managers, engineers, and workers. Finally, Soviet patriotism, Andre. If we say the system was able to mobilize resources, and the system created, and the cadre were up to the task of running the war over time, especially, they got better. There was a great deal of patriotism exhibited in the system. The patriotism was not Russian, it was Soviet. It was, of course, about the motherland, it was, of course, about socialism, it was about great power status, it was about Stalin as a leader. It was all of those factors thrown in together. The Germans contributed to Soviet patriotism because the German occupation was barbaric exterminationist. However, Soviet patriotism predated German barbarism and there were many Soviet patriots before the barbarism was fully revealed. The barbarism of the German occupation was important for those people who were less patriotic, were sitting on the fence, or were anti-Soviet and discovered that the Germans were worse than their own native uh, dictatorial regime. And so if you put together these three pieces, the system uh, as a whole, the cadre, and the patriotism, this adds to the industrialization story. The foreign imported technology, the machine tools, and the creation of aviation industry, tank industry, modern munition industry, all were major achievements accomplished at very high cost 
tremendous waste and contradictions, but also achievements. But that industrial achievement would not have been sufficient without the ability of the system to mobilize those resources, without the cadre in place in the localities, and without the patriotism exhibited in addition to the anti-Soviet uh, sentiments that we know about. And so the Soviet victory is explicable. We can explain it by these factors. We shouldn't romanticize it, just as we should not romanticize United States performance in the war, or as Adam pointed out, Germany's performance in the war. There were mistakes, waste, loss of life, even if you exceed, if you take the criminality aside. That's what war on this scale perforce always brings you. So in the end, a Soviet victory, which is explicable in my view by these factors. Okay, Adam, Germany defeat politic or economic or pure military? Right. Um, three minutes. <laughs> Uh, Andre, thank you very much. I'll just very briefly make three points, if I may. The first is that I would love to, I'd like to welcome the initiative of creating an institute or a center for the research of military economics in Moscow. Um, uh, and may I um, I'd take this occasion to offer my, my uh, cooperation and any services that I made to this wonderful endeavor. Um, it is, it is um, hugely important, not just because of, uh, to satisfy historical antiquarian interests, but because the politics of war economics and mobilization continue to matter. They evidently matter, mm. as Stephen has suggested, for the national mythology and the national history of Russia and the Soviet Union. But they also matter in very important ways outside, not so much in Europe, but in the United States. If you look at the rhetoric surrounding Operation Warp Speed, the great vaccine program of this year, if you look at the rhetoric surrounding the Green New Deal, the great hope of environmental activists in the United States, both of them are motivated by reference to the mythology of Freedom's Forge, the arsenal of democracy, the potential of American capitalism unleashed for the good. And we need to have a critical understanding of how this actually operates, and that has to be comparative. And the obvious comparator for the United States is the Soviet Union. Why? This is my second point. When you look, as Stephen has just said, war is murder, war is chaos, war is hell, <coughs> war is confusion, it's corruption, it's crime, it's all of those things. Any large project, when you look at it in detail, as he brilliantly did in his book, Magneto Gorse, will at some level look like that. So how do we, as it were, provide ourselves with a benchmark for saying with some degree of confidence making comparative metric comparisons. So in my book, Wages of Destruction, I used a very simple index. What was the pre-war industrial manufacturing output of the major countries? What is our best guess of their armament output during the war? And how do they stand in relation to each other? Very crude, but very broad brush estimates. And for the Western countries, the United States, Britain, and Germany, what you see is completely unsurprising. In other words, the ratio of all armaments output in the Western countries to their pre-war industrial production is the same. It's identical. All of them mobilize in roughly the way that you would predict. Okay. Stephen is right. They make a lot of aircraft, but then America's manufacturing was way ahead before the war. So that's not surprising. The one country that stands out is the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union produces far more armaments than you would have expected on the basis of its pre-war industrial base. Now, clearly part of that is to do with mobilization, but I don't think we can exclude the possibility, and Mark Harrison has demonstrated the existence of efficiency gain, learning curve effects, genuine, if you like, industrial progress within the Soviet system. Why was Germany as modest in its production achievement as it was, in the sense it just replicated what it did before the war, despite being an authoritarian dictatorship? If you want one single factor, and one that's very interesting by comparison with Britain on the one hand and the Soviet Union on the other, it's structural. It's not in the industrial sector, it's in the agrarian sector. It's the inability of Germany, which we think of as an industrial society, to actually mobilize its large peasant population into the war effort that distinguishes it, say, from Britain or the United States. And that, I think, is a crucial underestimated factor in this story. And on the other hand, the Stalinist system's iron grip on the Soviet countryside is the crucial complement to its mobilizing capacity in the war. 
that for me would be, as it were, if we're looking for big differences, that will be one of the places I would look. No social revolution in Nazi Germany. A racial revolution, yes, but no social and economic revolution. Adam. Okay, uh, Alexei, two minutes. Um, yes. Uh, a few words just. I agree to Stephen about uh, cadres uh, because uh, the people is a key um, element of any system. And um, in the Soviet system uh, exists um, a person like, uh, for example, Zaltzman. Uh, he was the head of a plan which produced uh, famous uh, T-34 tanks. And uh, Zaltzman was the person who made a T-34 uh, real mass production uh, weapon. And uh, Germany hasn't the same person in uh, its uh, complex panzer industry, uh, where I'm, to my mind. Where I know the uh, same person in, uh, in Germany. And uh, that's why the previously uh, railway factory became the leader of uh, tank production and maybe the same person exists in the uh, American industry. And uh, our uh, main um, task is define these persons, these key persons, uh, Zaltzman or anybody else who made uh, the system working. And uh, this is also my task to find, to define, to prove it with uh, papers, with archival sources, uh, to prove uh, the value of person who create the industry who win the, the terrible war. Okay, colleagues, uh, I think uh, we need to make sort of conclusion I believe that our discussion has revealed certain important factors which were not yet described in literature. And I hope that our discussion will continue. And uh, thanks for Adam, and I'm sure that Stephen will participate in our research. I basically agree with a lot of uh, possible criticism which relates to deficiencies in preparation or in strategy or in particular action during the war. And there were some research also in America, for example, my good friend, uh, Colin Hunter made a book called The Foundation of Economic Strategy, where he tried to make mathematical model of Soviet economy and to check whether different, more balanced, more smooth growth could provide better economy before the war than it was in fact, but still uh, the system, as Stephen said, was able to mobilize and people were patriotic and they were able to learn and military people were able to learn and somehow the system survived and then was victorious. And we still have a lot of things to do to understand the real factors, the real people who made this system work because system doesn't work without the people. Uh, all uh, catastrophes, as Kaganovich said, has name, surname, and ochestva. Uh, and also the victory should have names, should have particular persons, and victories in economy should have particular persons. Not only Stalin, not only Vesnitsensky, but a lot of people who really contributed to this victory, which gives us a lot of lessons how the economy should work, in the strategy, in the crisis, how should be mobilized in modern situation. And there is a lot of things to be learned from the history of our war. Thank you all very much for this participation in our section. And I do hope that we'll have a lot of things to be done in the future. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah.